15 years ago, I started thinking this is going to be, this web stuff is going to be the next, the next stage for storytelling. Um, and it's going to create different type of stories. And I got very excited by that, but there was very little work in that field. So I went into the academic side of things. So I uh, started, I did an MA in interactive media, and then I started uh, teaching. Then I did a PhD on interactive documentary. And effectively, it means that for the last 15 years, I've been either studying, writing, uh, teaching, um, coaching, mentoring projects. Um, and, and lately, this year, I've started a, a training scheme uh, uh, with the help of the European Commission, the EU, called IFLAB, which is an attempt to basically train people to do interactive documentaries. So, so that's who I am. Now, I think after this introduction, we can, we can actually really start. So, OK, so not knowing very much about what you know, uh, the idea here, so iDocs obviously come from interactive documentary. It's a shortened way of doing it. By the way, the term uh, is something that uh, I more or less forged five years, five, six years ago when I started to create a <coughs> conference which is called iDocs. So there's an iDocs conference which you can have more information about in iDocs.org that uh, I co-direct. Um, and really, probably, you have heard of all those bizarre terms, whether they are transmedia, docu-game, webdoc. Often webdoc is probably most used as a, as a term. I mean, there's a it's big terminology. Every day we invent a new one. That's not really the point. And, and the reason is that some people are really concerned on what happens to documentary when they go on the web. And other people say, yeah, but OK, but what happens to documentary if they go in more than one platform than the web. So that's a transmedia. So we have a vast terminology. Let's not even go there, because it's not particularly interesting. We actually want to see examples, I think. So for today, let's stick to the terminology of iDoc. And I'll, I'll give you a definition of what I mean by that anyway. Yeah. But let's go back to basics and to you know, sort of well-defined definition, well-accepted, sorry, definition of documentary as a creative treatment of actuality. So let's, let's uh, accept this definition. And the thing is, when I speak about linear documentary, I'm really thinking about linear format in general. Wh why is it linear? The media through which you would do a film documentary, a, a video documentary, would be through a roll or a videotape. So it's something that you consume from the beginning till the end as, a, as an audience in a linear path. Yeah? There, is, there is no choice while you're there. You're listening to the story, watching the story. Uh, you might obviously have a sort of interactive level in your mind, your, your reasoning, understanding, creating connections. But your connections stay in your mind. They don't influence the media, the documentary. Okay. So trying to understand a bit the differences between an interactive documentary and a linear one, we would say that you know, I, uh, an iDoc is by definition, if not, it's not an interactive documentary, it is non-linear. So it doesn't sit on a media that you know, makes you have a beginning, you know, a middle, and an end. It is feasible, obviously, if I take my documentary that I shot and I put it on YouTube and I leave it there, it's on a digital format. But really, I would not consider this an interactive documentary. It's not the fact that you've put it on YouTube that makes it interactive. It makes it digital. It makes it available. It doesn't make it an interactive documentary. Yeah? In order to have something that I would call interactive documentary, you, you really need to have interaction. And interaction is a big word. We don't know so many definitions again. But what I mean, you know, let's put it back to basics, is this idea that the user, so the former audience, and I don't like the name users because they're not really using anything but when it's a story. So I, I normally call them the interactors. Um, but normally everybody says users, so let's you know, go for a terminology that everybody understands. It means that the user, by doing something, becomes part, has a feedback loop with the story that effectively can change, alterate, do something, do something to the story itself. This story has to unfold, can only unfold through the help 
of the user. Yeah. So just for the sake of definitions, this is my own definition, so you know, take it with a pinch of salt, really. Um, but I would say that I know the fact of using documentary as a term in interactive documentary automatically means that people tend to say, OK, I know what a documentary is. It's, you know, it's a piece of video that tells a story. And now it's that stuff on the web, interactive documentary. Well, no. Um, I would go much broader than a documentary as we understand it. I would go for something that is anything that is trying to document the real. So factual narrative. So this is what you're doing all the time. You might not describe yourself as documentary makers when I've asked you at the beginning. None of you. But for me, you know, doing a piece of factual narrative, if it's written, it's a form of documenting the real. Now, the question here is, is today you want to speak about a story that is important to you, but you don't want to do it on paper, you don't want to do it for a linear format, and you start thinking, how can I use the mobile phone, the web, the tablet, all those uh, <coughs> platforms who allows you to interact with it, then if I want to use those, how do I tell my story? What does it change to the way I'm going to tell my story? So as we saw before in that definition of documentary as it is, or journalist, the fact of going interactive doesn't change your intention. So your intention is still to deliver an information. But what it changes is because you're going to use a complete different platform, it's going to change the form and it's going to change the way it's received by your audience. Yeah? So, a bit still a bit in the introduction, but we'll go th quickly through that and hopefully then indulge in more examples. So, for example, if um, you think about the media, how much the media is influencing the contract and, and, and the output. So imagine your television set and, and your newspapers. Now, behind that, as an author, and I'm assuming that you're all journalists and would consider yourself authors of your stories, you, know, you have a contract with the people who are there. And this is a often explicit contract or implicit contract, which is, I am going to tell you a story on both cases. Now, you either have to watch from the beginning to the end, then you can make up your mind, or you're going to read it from the beginning to the end, and then you'll make up your mind about it. So my contract to you is sit there, watch, or read, and then we'll see. Now, if you're doing an interactive documentary, though, your proposition, and I think this is quite important from your point of view if you were thinking to do that, this type of, uh, of project, is you're not saying anymore, I have a story to tell you, sit and watch. You're now saying, I actually have a dynamic world. I have a proposition for you. Now you have a position to take in this. This is why it's interactive. You have a position. You need to come inside my world. And my job is to create this dynamic world and give you options. Yeah? And so effectively, what is happening is that your proposition is the proposition of doing together, not anymore read or watch, but doing together. And it means that your job as an interactive producer or author is to think, OK, I know more or less what the story is that I want to say, but what or is my user, what am I allowing my user to do, feel, want, need within my story? So you need to give a level of agency. The other side of interactivity means that there is your user has an agency. Agency is a definition from Janet Murray. Effectively means the power of doing something in this story. And if you want your story to work in an interactive uh, setting, this doing needs to be somehow meaningful to the user. So using interactivity just for the sake of it is completely boring. And that is the real challenge is how, what is it that the user might want to do, might need to do in order to feel part of this? This is the trick. And this becomes much more the type of things, that the decisions that you need to take as an interactive author. The story is still there, but now you have this other level of complexity. How do we do it together? So 
I like to speak about the interactive documentary of something that is <coughs> relational because anything that sits on the web, if you don't click on something to go to the next level, <coughs> doesn't move. So by definition, an interactive documentary needs a relationship with the other, whether it is the computer, whether it is the web, whether it is the user. So it's a certain, if you look at it, it's like a web of possibility and they're all, each of them are influencing each other. But what it means also is that effectively you want your users to do something. Your emphasis is not anymore, you know, what am I going to say to them, but more what do I want them to do within the universe that I'm creating. Again, a shift of mind from the author. And that's from where I think we should start to look at examples. Just with this question that is, if you ever wanted to become uh, authors of interactive documentary, what is your role as a journalist and as an author? What do you give? What are the options that you have? Now, there is big literature about this, and I actually just simplified with m something that I, I felt made sense, but you know, very hap happy to see if it works for you. But uh, effectively, I think that there is a trade, I mean, there is, there, is, there is this balance. The more you want to keep your story alive, so you want to say your story, the less agency you need to give to your users. Yeah? That, that's clear? No reaction? The more I ask people, you can click here, you can send me content, you can... Uh, um, what are the ways in which this agency can be done? You know, it's a lot of user-generated content, you can add comments, you can... The more I give stuff to my users to do, so they give, I give them more agency, the less I keep the control of my story. So there's a difference between, you know, click on a few hyperlinks to read the next part of the story and we're going to speak about democracy. Tell me what you think about it. I don't know what's going to be in this documentary. It's what you've sent me that is going to populate it. So there's a big level difference between those two types of interactive documentary. One is trying to control the story and the other one is trying to open it. So you have, a, you know, like think about interactivity as a spectrum. You can have low interactivity, very high interactivity. And this is part of the decisions you need to take. So the, I would say, simpler way, and this is what most people are doing because we're in a transition stage. We, you know, the interactive documentary are only 15 to 20 <laughs> years old. So we're still experimenting with this form, is something that I would call, you know, keep your story. People, a lot of people have a story to tell. They still <coughs> want to say their story, and so, but then they want it to be on the web. So what do they do? They effectively say, well, let's make it look a bit more media rich. So it's not going to be just text. I'm going to add, you can click on a video, you can click on a, a link, but effectively any of those things is not changing the story I'm saying. It's extra stuff. Yeah. And if you wanted to have a metaphor for that, it's a bit like saying, now let's see each other as architects. It's a bit like saying, I want to build a road and I want to keep control on my road because that's my story. I know where it starts and I know where it goes and I know how it goes there. So I want to keep my story safe. I want to write my paper. Okay. But because I want to make it a bit more fun because it needs to be media rich, I'm going to invent a few buildings on the side that people can explore. So I'm going to put a link here, I'm going to put a video there, um, a 3D model there. But those effectively are not influencing my, my street. They are just buildings and park, but the content is in my street. So that's option one. By the way, this is what everybody's doing at the moment. It's much less scary and it's easier for people, users to understand. Let's second step, let's open interactivity a bit more. Let's give a bit more agency. So ha now we can say, well, I'm not actually anymore sure that I want to tell my story. I want to be more like a curator within a topic. Topic could be racial issues, could be, you know, and, and what I'm going to do there is I'd like to choose few things which I think are very interesting, especially lots of points of views of lots of people. So I'm not going to tell my story. I want to have the point of views of other people on racial issues. Um, but I'm going to select those people. So I'm still doing my interviews, deciding who is cool, who should com be on my story, and I'm going to put them there. So back to our metaphor, it's a bit like having, instead of being a straight road, I'm now building a square. 
And within this square, so it's not anymore something that has beginning and an end, but I'm going to select sculpture, I'm going to populate things, I'm curating these. This is an exhibition that I'm curating. And if I give up even more of curating and even more of the story and decide to give even more agency to my users, then I'm on the third one, which effectively is, you know, when you go for a very high spectrum of interactivity, which often means accepting to have user-generated content only in your stories, then you're into another paradigm. You actually somehow facilitate. You don't even know anymore what is going to happen in your universe that you've created, for example, online. I don't know what people are going to send me if they are discussing about racial issues. So in that case, it's a bit like I'm not even doing the square anymore. I'm providing a tool. My job as an interactive uh, producer there is to create a platform for people to be able to express themselves. And so that is the large spectrum of interactivity. So what we're going to do now is for each of those category, I would say, we're going to have a look to some examples. Now, we'll never be able to do them all. So maybe we're going to choose them together. So first option, let's say the easy one, the one that we all understand and I'm sure you've all seen, is this one. It's the fact of having um, a control on your story. Now, how many of you have seen Snowfall? Something that the New York Times has done. How many? Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> Most of you. Shall we skip it? Now, you can, you can speak. It's very long. <laughs> no, no, we're not, we, we won't go through everything. Yeah. I want to show you just the style because what I want to tell you is how there are fashions as well in interactive documentaries. So if you look at the date 2012, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I just want to show you the style. I'm not going to go through the story. I'm gonna but effectively, when I'm saying I keep the control of my story, this is what I mean. This is an experiment New York Times did 2012, so we're speaking about you know, three years ago, not that long ago, and everybody went, wow, a newspaper is going to do something which is effectively media rich. That's all it is. Conceptually, it's not a big deal. It is an article that I can scroll. So this is, I'm doing like this with my fingers, it's the scrolling parallax style which has been influenced and came up uh, along because we're now using the tablet, so it's much easier to go like this or like that. Okay, so now that's influencing the way we're... And so this is an article, you know, this is the street that I was telling you at the beginning, and I'm going to put something to make it look a bit more sexy. There's a video here. Or, you know, I keep going down and, you know, it, it, it looks... But it's an article. And I've put my little things to see on the side. Okay. This is an effort to go from a completely linear storytelling logic to something where there is some interaction. But the interaction is literally, am I watching this video, yes or not? Yeah? So if this is the beginning, oh, sorry. then let's see how two years later, other newspapers like The Guardian, I've selected only things which I thought were interesting for journalist. So all of the examples I've chosen here are somehow geared at a more journalistic audience. So same logic of scrolling parallax, but now we're on the newspaper like The Guardian two years later and they're doing a story about the cost of our cheap garments, what we're buying for very little money and that effectively has a cost in terms of human lives. So it's, if you, I, I'm going to go very quickly through it. We don't have the time to read each of those or 10, 15 minutes experiences. So you'll have to do that by yourself and all the links will be given to you. But what I want to show you is more, it's how it's the same logic as the other one, but we're a step further. Now we have something moving in the background, not that it changes that much. It's still an article effectively but it looks a bit more sophisticated. So we have audio. Okay. We have the article. So on the background, there should be an image. You then go to a video which is not even more choice anymore. That's 
So you're obliged to go through different things. And more of the story. So same as before, I'm telling my story. I have my road, but I'm going to put stuff in the middle so that it looks a bit more sexy, a bit more sophisticated in terms of navigation. I can now jump to different side of my story, go directly there. And also, here, <coughs> sorry, there is something I say. In the 1 minute 55 minutes that you've been with us, you've you spend reading, uh, someone you know, has earned 0 0.04 pounds, while the UK retailers have already sold for uh, 167,000 pounds. So it's this idea of putting you in, 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 in context, okay, through your time. You can't even read it because it's on the bottom, but you would normally. And this is supposed to, you're supposed to have a video in the background, but I think our internet is way too poor. So what we'll do is, I'll might go, just in case the, vid, the internet was very poor, I actually also recorded it. So we'll go through the records because I think it's going to be. So back to what we were saying. So we're, this is an example of, those are articles, but they look media rich, OK? Um, The other style that is still actually in the same logic, although it looks very different, is the idea of using either the game or a first person style. So it's this idea that now that we can be interactive, I can say, hey, what about if it was you looking at this story? Be inside the story. Mm -hmm. The first person shooter is now the user and not the cameraman. Yeah? So for example, um, and the very first People who did something that was quite well known, 2007. So it tells you that's really the beginning. 2007 is not that long ago. So it's a form that is re very recent. Who has seen Journey to the End of Call? Only two, three. OK. But I think I'll skip it anyway. I mean, this it will give you an idea of how this style started. It's a photographer who went around in China and came back with loads of photos and decided to tell a story through those photos. And it's a branching narrative. So you're now a journalist, and you're doing the trip that he did. But you're doing it as a first person. You have to take choices. What am I going to ask to those people? I'm looking at the Chinese authorities. It's about the mining situation in China and how <coughs> the human conditions there are poor. So what are the decisions I take as a journalist? So it, that was done only with still photos. and. That's 2007. If you go 2010, so it's only two years later, for example, if you remember, there was the Haiti earthquake uh, in 2010. And this is a piece that was done, I think, by Canadian people, actually. And the idea was, what about, what does it feel to go there and, you know, now that after the earthquake and to take a position? So what does it mean to take a position to start with? So if we start the experience, we now have a choice. So our choice is, do we want to be in the position of a survivor? Do we want to be in the position of one of the journalists? So make up your mind about what happened there. Or do we want to be an aid worker, for example? Now, if I click on one of those options, let's imagine that I want to be uh, an aider. So this is a branching narrative. Huh? We started from a first screen. We went into three options. I clicked one option. Now I have one single option, which is, so I have an introduction, four days after the earthquake, blah, blah, blah. Um, so see the latest news. The latest news. So this is, this is a little piece of uh, a video, if it runs. And Effectively, it's a branching narrative. What is it doing? I mean, I don't have only one road. I'm building several roads. But each of those roads, I, as the author, I have full control of what is happening there. You know, I have shot that video. I've decided for the branching narrative. I've decided what are your options. So I'm keeping the control of the story. That piece of interactive documentary got very used by uh, social workers actually after, after the Haiti earthquake, because 
they, they, they understood that it was actually one of the best ways, so we didn't have time to go through it, to train the social workers. People who would arrive didn't have a clue of what was going on, what to do. And the fact, so this is a, have a, a sort of game-ish logic, that's why I've put it into game. Effectively, it's a, it's a branching narrative where you are one of the protagonists. Yeah. But in the same logic of how to do use a game and a first person point of view, Literally now, and this is Al Jazeera, I don't know if you, I've put on purpose here the names of the production companies. Honky Tonk specializes in interactive experiences, but the others, BBC, PTV Production, Al Jazeera, those are big players. And then you have independent players as well now, um, like uh, Vasiliki and Navid. Um, but it really means that this is, a, oh, the big players are trying to experimenting and, and see what can we do. So for example, Al Jazeera, this is a piece where, again, I'm the journalist. It looks much more like a game now. I have a brief, which looks like, a, like an email. I accept the assignment. I get information about Sierra Leone. This is about a piece about pirate fishing. Um, and I'm now becoming the journalist who needs to find within this landscape, which is the world that has been designed for me, enough information to make up my mind. What are my tools? I'm going to have fake mobile phone where I'm going to receive messages. So you can, you can tell that these, just even from the um, interface point of view, looks much more like a game. Yeah? While the others looked more like a training. So again, we have a piece of video to set the frame, telling me about the situation now from the international tour that's actually coming to the coast and they stick to the law. I've been listening to the law. We have an area called <coughs> that is Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the inshore exclusion of the zone. Yeah. And that is where the Marine Center is coordinated point. So these are areas where the industrial vessels and semi industrial vessels are not allowed to fish. It's an area being So I didn't go through all the video, but that was setting the scene. And now you can see here, very clearly, I have my stage, my investigation points. So it's about points, so all these are dynamics, game dynamics, uh, badges. Am I an activist, city explorer, notebook? I can collect evidence throughout this experience, put it into my notebooks, um, and obviously share. Okay, now. Again, unfortunately, I think th this is going to be a bit frustrating for you. We, we really don't have the time to go through all the thing. But I, I'd like to show you a lot of different styles, and then you can always go back to them. So this is the gaming option. Now, how many of you, the other option that you have, I mean, even if it's a game, still within that type of game, everything has been set for you. That's why I think it's still controlling the story. Yeah? It, you control a world, but you're still controlling it. For those of you who are interested in this type of thing, there, is, there will be soon to be released an amazing piece of work, uh, 1979 Revolution, uh, that's been done by um, a couple, the Consari couple. And this is about the Iranian Revolution. And it's really said those guys worked before on Grand Theft Auto. So there are people who really come from the, the world of gaming. Um, Navid is, Vasiliki is a documentary maker, and together they decided how can we use the best that we know of game dynamics, but to use it so that, again, you will be, you the user, will be in the middle of the Iranian revolution, going through it, you know, having adventures, and really trying to make up your mind of, you know, wh what happened there, you know, and which were the sides, and what were America doing, et cetera, et cetera. So, that's going to be, I think, a big, big hit because it's trying to be much more commercial in a way, you know. And uh, I think it's an interesting area. This is the area that you might have heard as referred as uh, serious games. Um, this idea of using game dynamics to speak about reality and serious stuff. Another option, still controlling your story very much, but making look interactive, is to go to this idea of, I'm going to show you different point of views. And one example, which was, did quite a lot of uh, press, was Alma. Did any of you watched Alma? Okay. Now, 
Alma is a long interview. That's a project done by Upion, which is a French production company who specializes in interactive experiences. They work a lot with Arte television. Uh, this is a piece of investigative journalism in the sense that it's a very long interview with one uh, woman from Guatemala who used to be in the gangs. So she has gone through all the violence that you can imagine. And this is like a 40 minute uh, interview with her. Um, and the only interaction that you have here, so it's a very simple type of interaction, it was designed mainly for the iPad, is that either you look at her while she's speaking, or you scroll a little bit and you look at a sort of video of what she's saying. So it's very small as an interaction. It's like having one level of audio and two tracks of video. So all you can do is to go up or down and see basically choose between the video tracks. And the idea behind that was that when something is super powerful and someone is doing a confession, your only choice is where do I want to watch this person in the eyes or do I want to, it's too much, I'm taking my glance away. And that's what they were trying to reproduce with the interactivity. And I'm... Tenía 15 años cuando quería integrarme a, a una pandilla. Yo se sabía desde el principio que las reglas eran matar, robar, extorsionar y otras cosas que se hacen dentro de la pandilla. Bueno, al inicio que cuando llegué a la casa donde la tenían a esta chica, mis homies, y la violaron y yo miraba cuando la estaban violando, pero luego me dieron la orden de, de matarla, pues porque nos podía delatar con la policía y todo esto. Entonces, eh, Okay, so this is the playing that I was no, telling no, you. No teníamos arma, porque en ese momento no había ninguna arma. For as frustrating as this is, I'll have to stop the interview. But this this is all you can do. You go up and down. If you go down, you can you you see video material, but you still hear her voice. So one audio track, two video tracks, and but it's you deciding when is it too much to bear her confession. Yeah. So this is a very subtle, as I was saying, there are levels of interactivities and they can be extremely subtle. Um, you don't, we don't have to think about you know, the, full, the full thing. But what is interesting is on the back of that, that created a sort of trend and I'm gonna show you what only two years later, so like in the scrolling parallax, you have snowfall at the beginning, then everybody, not copies, but gets inspired, does it richer. Here, you have one idea, super simple. Two years later, Submarine Channel does something about, again, pirating. So what you're seeing here is that the same trick of going up and down that was used in Alma, two years later is used to speak about uh, you know, pirates in Somalia. And the idea here is we're going to see the two point of views. You know, if, I go, if I go up on my screen, I see the, let's say, continental point of view. If I go down, I see the Somali point of view. So, the two opposites, the two enemies, if you, you know, if you can put it in brackets, tell their story and you go from one to the other one. Okay? So <coughs> that's an, another example of what I meant by showing the other point of view. You know, one story, different point of views, just by using this trick of up and down. Um, now let's go to this. Those were all examples where I keep control of my story. Now let's try to go to example where I open up a bit. So that's the second type where I'm curating a discussion. So a very old example, but I think you know, effective is seven billion <coughs> others. I'm not saying very old and it's 2009. So let's take this with a pinch of salt. But I call those the mosaic interfaces. What are they? This is the idea. This, wh why is it curating? Here the topic was, what is it to be human, big topic, in this world? <laughs> so effectively what they did is they interviewed 5,000 people, 500, 5,000, can't remember. And then from there onwards, 
they accepted participation from anybody and users. It's a set of questions, 40 questions if I remember well. What do you believe in? Or what are you afraid of? Uh, you know, what is love? Uh, what is death? I mean, big questions. And, and each person um, gives an answer. So you can click on this person and she will answer to a certain number of questions. And I can jump from one to the other of the questions. So you can see on the right here, memories. This is uh, happiness. So here the concept is to go for, that's why I'm saying curating. I am curating, I'm deciding the questions. But I then open up, I create a platform for people to participate. I don't own the content. I don't know what the content will be. Um, so there is a level of openness that you don't have on, you know, in the first style, if I might say, of interactive documentary. Now, that is 7 billion others. Then created a series of other babies, like Beyond 9-11, series of interviews, a very beautiful piece interviews about 9-11 where everybody has been interviewed, whether it is the politicians, whether it is the victim, whether it is the Islamics, and everybody is mixed in this array of questioning what really happened there. And obviously the idea of those pieces, because they are mosaic, is that you know, there is not one truth, there are as many truths as there are people being interviewed. But as an author, you don't take position. Because you don't have the beginning, middle, and end, you never end up with a conclusion. You stay in this openness of point of views. Yeah? Now, I suspect people will know about Gazas the Rot. Nope. Well, we're not going to go through it. <laughs> but that is a piece that within the world of interactive documentary would be very well known. So I suggest that when you download, if you want to download the, this presentation, you go and check it. This was a piece about uh, the conflict, Palestina, uh, it's two, two places on the side of the border, Gaza and Zderot. And the idea is, what is the life like on both sides of the wall, you know, uh, Israel, Palestina. And the idea is the interface itself has a wall. It shows, it's very well known because the interface here tells you half of the story. So you see the interface of this piece is based <coughs> on the fact of having always a line in the middle, and on one side you'll have the point of views of Zderot, on the other one, Gaza. And you can browse through topics, through people, etc., etc. Okay. A little bit the same idea of the point of views. Okay, so let's move into the third area. So a bit less control, and now even less control. Um, what I call the living documentary, so something that effectively is, is, is open really to participation for people. While 7 billion others, to be honest, the first 500 or 5,000 interviews, I can't remember, were actually directed, and so there was a control. Here, for example, you have a project like Question Bridge, which is um, a project about what does it mean to be a black male in the US today. And the way it's done is that it's an open invitation to people to post questions. So you have people who will have questions and others. Black man, do you want to get out of the situation that you're in? What is the reluctance for taking responsibility for improving our community? <laughs> Are your children better or worse off as a result of your fault? Why wouldn't you be happy with your son being gay? Why are you so violent? Why do you have that take mentality? Why are you afraid of being intelligent? Why? 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 What I want to know is, why? I believe that we've incorporated a lot of things that are unhealthy to us. We are supposed to be tough. I can't let them see no type of sucker along with various other stereotypes. The level of mentorship in our community is not as strong as it possibly could be. When I came up, crack was a quick way for a black man to make a million dollars. Sometimes I think because we think we're black, we, we're some other kind of human beings, but we're just like most other human beings. So that's the trailer for it. But if you want to explore the project, the interactive project, you select a person 
the person comes up with a question, and then whoever has decided to answer that question is browsable. So you can select question and answers. So it's an open invitation to form a dialogue that is viewable worldwide through the internet. But it's a dialogue. But that's what I meant. You know, you're not even curating, because if you were curating, you would decide what are the questions. Here you're really facilitating a discussion. You're creating a space for discussion. And I think this is the, you know, how you know, the, the top level of interactivity that you can imagine when you're doing an interactive documentary. Um, now, there is, this year, there's been two big things that happened, two, two technological novelties. One is the fact that personalization has started to be used in uh, uh, narrative, interactive narrative, and the other one is virtual reality. Now, what do we mean by personalization? So we all know that the Googles, the Facebook of this world are, you know, using, tracking us, knowing what we're doing so that they then propose things that might be of interest to us. You know, the advertising on uh, a Gmail that is linked to our emails, yeah? But the thing is, Storytellers have started to think, okay, how can we use the same logic but to actually create stories which are more interesting for the person, that put the person in the middle of the story, that effectively <coughs> give a role to the user within the story. So one of the projects that came up this year, and this year you have three big interactive documentaries that came up with this logic, but one of those is Do Not Track. How many of you have heard of Do Not <coughs> Track? A few. So the idea of Do Not Track is to um, speak about data mining. And the way it's done, and the reason for which it's personalized, is that there are a series of episodes. But once you start one episode, you have someone asking you questions, and you reply. Now, as you reply, it shows you how you've been either tracked on your mobile phone. So each episode has a different topic. It could be you know, why is your mobile phone sending information uh, to, you know, the corporate? And so it was going to use your data to show you what you are risking. We've all got our predictions. We've all got our predictions. Mine is to wake up, get caffeine, and go online. A little bit on a desktop, a bit on my phone. In the morning, I give away gigabytes of information about myself, and I give it without being asked. This is my name. This is where I live. This is me on Twitter, and these are my photos. All this I share out of habit. I guess it's also part of the routine. Some would even call it an addiction. There's a lot that I share without knowing it, and so do you. For instance, I know right now that this is the country you live in. I know that it's a nice morning. So I vlogged I in from that. London. You're on a map. These is are this? things I know just from where you're accessing this website before the day even gets started. So that's personalized to me, so yeah? Let's start the day. Sorry. Part of my everyday routine is to see what the world is doing. Tell me where you go to get your news. So I'll stop here for a second. So you see how it's made. You know, there's an information that is the same for everybody. The images actually are not the same for everybody. Um, it's going to track a certain number of information about me that I logged in London. So it's going to retrieve shots about London through, I don't know, whether it is, uh, you know, um, I don't know what they've used actually, but actually for open pools of information. And then it's going to ask me, what I, where do I go to look for information? And it's going to use my data directly to visualize the next part of the story. So the next part of the story is going to be personalized to me because if you had put another website, it would have been completely different. Yeah. So let's see the next part. So I put bbc.com. Let's imagine. The blue dot that you're seeing represents the site you are visiting right now. The red dots represent third parties who are notified each time you visit that site. Some of these third parties are called trackers, an ecosystem of data collection agencies. So you see how it is constructed. I mean, the 13 dots that came from the BBC are exclusive to the BBC. So those are, that, that is information relevant to what I've put as an input. 
And then when it starts to do an explanation of what are the trackers, that will be the same for everybody. Yeah? They compare where you are on the web right now to where you've been before. And each time you browse, they learn more about you. Let's go back. Now I'm distracting myself from work by looking for something funny. What about you? Where do you go for laughs? So this again, it, that's me inputting these. I was just recording my screen grabs, huh? so I did that uh, the other day, I can't remember. And now it's remembering... Now browse between two sites. Do you see the connections between the dots? Right, and that's where I stop because there's a whole episode and you're very welcome to do it with your own things. You can also allow Do Not Track to track you just for the sake of the experiment and it will come up in the next episode with information that normally you're giving for free to third parties and you don't realize it. So it's a real piece of informational journalism. I think it, this is journalism but done in a completely different, with a different logic, which is, okay, we're speaking about something that we all know, it's all nasty, oh, oh, but what about you? You know, what, what's your situation? And now the story is going to, to a point, explore your situation. Give you data profile, give you psychological profiling, et cetera, et cetera. So there are seven episodes, if I remember well. I really, really think it, it won a lot of awards this year. I really think you should uh, have a look to that. And the other big novelty is what was started by actually Noni de la Peña, um, which is a journalist who at least 10 years ago started saying VR, we need to use VR to do news, to be there, okay? So Noni de la Peña started this, a lot of this research 10 years ago. In the meantime, last year, the Oculus Rift suddenly became something that might be a reality soon, although I believe it's not, or, you know, we, we, we can find it, but it's not already um, commercialized. But a lot of people are going excited about, ooh, what can we do with virtual reality? For now, it's still Google's that you have to put here, but there's a cheap way of doing it with a, you know, a cardboard that you can just buy online and cost next to nothing that you attach to your mobile phone. And through that, you can actually scope around because your mobile phone allows you to jocalize and to know what your movement is. So if you go like this, you're going to see what's up. It's going like that. It's going to, okay? Gives you a feeling of what that 3D can be. Now, the real problem for journalists is what do we do with this? I mean, is it morally okay? And actually, is it interesting whatsoever to have as a proposition, wow, now we can put you on the spot where things are happening? Is that what we want? I don't know. This comes up with lots of issues, I think, from a moral point of view, ethical point of view, and also, I think, from a point of view of a storyteller, is it enough to put you there? Is that, is that what it is about? Or what, how can we use this tool more effectively? Now, if we have, yeah, we do have another 10 minutes. I want to show you, just because I think this is really the latest flavor, the latest thing in the world of interactive documentary, I would say. But it's, it, it is affecting news. This is actually the news where there is the most projects which are coming up. Um, and I want to see you, show you, unfortunately, I got you, we cannot see the thing because we don't have, at the moment, the, 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 the Oculus Rift. So it's very difficult to show you. But there is a, a, a demo, a promo, a trailer, sorry, online that I want to show you about Clouds Over Sidra. A few, there are at least three projects that were done this year about Syria and what it is like to be there. Um, and this will just be a YouTube video, I think. That's all I could find to show you, to give you a feeling of what the experience wants to be. Again, Al Jazeera, by the way. a really emotional experience, I think more than I had anticipated. And even as someone who works on the Syrian humanitarian crisis every day, I don't think I've ever been grabbed so emotionally. If you see that, how, how could you not want to do something about this? You know, how could you not want to contribute or sign the petition that's 
you know, at the very least, or get involved with an organization and somehow volunteered for this crisis that's happening. You know, it was very heartbreaking to see. But at the same time, it's necessary. get really disoriented and you, know, you kind of forget you're, you're just standing in DC and not really at the camp. You're, you're placed in a, in, a, in, a, in a camp, in a room with uh, a girl um, showing you around. So I think it's really playing on your emotions. So there is some things for which VR is extremely good, which is giving you a sense of scale. You know, you suddenly realize how small a tent is, how, you know, you, you do feel you, 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 your system empathically actually, you know, um, makes you feel there. But the problem is, what do you do with this feeling as an author? How do you lead this story so that it doesn't become a pathetic, uh, you know, let's all cry together and then donate money for Syria? I mean, I think that this could be a problem. Now, on the same, um, th th another example that I'd like to show you, and, and that will be it for today, because I think it's, it's um, well, actually, there are two. Let's see. No, we'll have to choose one. Um, OK, but they're using the same logic. The other logic is we could use VR to, and this is a big theme at the moment this year, to provoke empathy. So what about if I could see what you can see? That's more or less the proposition. So this logic can be used in two ways. In a serious way, this is a project, the enemy. The idea here is, you know, two sides of a conflict. Both people are accusing the other. What about if I could see what the other one thinks of me? What the other one understands? Yeah? So that effectively, I'll understand that we're all human and we, we have the same fears. It's just that we come from another culture. So that's the bottom line. So this is a project that is being prototyped at the moment by a photojournalist. By the way, a lot of photojournalists are going into this, uh, this idea of VR because it's an extension of you know, their, their, their way of, of, of their art, in a way. The problem I think I'll show you now, it's more the machine to be another because it's a bit more detached and shows you the options. So this is, this is a series of uh, young guys, uh, be another lab, who decided to use available technology to play this role, to play with VR, to be the other. So yes, it could be used to understand conflict, but it can also be used in their mind to empathize for uh, race issues, gender issues, etc. So I'll show you their demo because it's actually quite fun. It's literally their website. And, um, and it will give you an idea of what they're trying to do, I think. sound is particularly bad and this is a YouTube video and so you can go and check it and we'll go through the end but I just want to make sure that you understand what's happening here because it's not always obvious. If you're both, this is the assumption here, if we're both having you know a VR Hamlet uh, so we, I'm see, I could see what you are seeing and you could see what I am seeing. Okay so now if you are a male and I am a woman I could see the point of view, your hand being a male hand and your body being, and, and feel like if it's mine because I'm seeing it through my eyes. Yeah? Here, the idea is the gender situation. So I'm now, hang on, who am I? So if I'm, if I'm white, I see my hand when I do this, I see my hand as being black because I'm seeing your point of view. You get, you get me? Yeah, it's obvious? Good. The machine to be another combines neuroscience protocols with art performances to trick the brain's perception of one's own body. Instead of 
cells in themselves in the body of a digital avatar, like in most of the neuroscience studies. The machine allows users to see themselves in the body of a real person. What I wanted to show you was this uh, this difference on genre actually in between all those projects. Because if you start from something like uh, you know, a text that is online, that is on your tablet, but effectively looks like um, a, an article with uh, a few videos. From that to a VR experience, going through in the middle something where you're literally just opening a debate and asking people to answer and to pose questions. I mean, those are completely different types of experiences. Um, I think they all can be very useful for journalists. You know, the, the VR is creating a big thing. You know, um, Chris Milk has done things about uh, what is it like to be inside uh, a demonstration. What is it like uh, to be in uh, in Sidra? What is it like? So there is this also this idea. Noni de la Peña did something about Syria. Again, you know, looking at kids in refugee camps. Is the fact of being there creating an empathy? And, and there, the interactivity is really used for empathy much more than in the early project that I showed you, where interactivity is more a click and choose. So it's about giving you some sort of power on what you want to see next. Bizarrely, when you go into VR experiences, you don't choose anything, really. You can move around, but you're not clicking on options. The, there are no options. It's the world around you that you are exploring. So the levels of interactivity of agency, as I said at the before, and the result, I think the, you know, what is the oomph, what does it do for you if you're the user, are totally different. And they can be used for different purposes in your journalistic stories. So that's it. Thank you very much. Okay.